War II intervened and the tobacco book was never published. Rapport served in the Army from 1941 to 1948. And in 1948, he and author Norwood Jr. published Rendezvous with Destiny, a history of the 101st Airborne Division. Rapport had studied at the University of North Carolina with R.D.W. Connor, who became the first archivist of the United States. From 1949 until his retirement in 1984, Rapport had a distinguished career at the National Archives as an authority on the Constitutional Convention and the Bill of Rights. Several of his warehouse interviews have been anthologized, and he often wrote articles on archival subjects. I met Leonard at the National Archives in the late 1960s when I was working on my dissertation. In 1981, when I was working on Breaking the Land, I interviewed Leonard, and he lent me his tobacco manuscript, which I profited enormously from. It was in that interview that he revealed that he had escorted Marion Post Walcott when she did this shoot of the tobacco warehouses in 1939. Marion Post Walcott's biography is better known than that of Leonard Rapport. She grew up in a comfortable, although troubled, household. In Europe, as a young woman, she attended school, spent time with her sister Helen in Austria, and discovered that she had a good photographic eye. She came onto the Farm Security Administration payroll in 1938, and the head of the photography section, Roy Stryker, gave her routine assignments, which she certainly made the most of. Stryker had reservations about sending a single woman to the South. Dorothy Lane usually traveled with her husband, Paul S. Taylor, and Stryker worried not only about Walcott's safety, but also about the complications that might result from a white woman photographing black subjects. Walcott was clearly able to handle herself in difficult situations, thanking the tire here. In the fall of 1939, she traveled to North Carolina to follow up on a project begun that June by Dorothy Lane. And, and she was working with University of North Carolina scholars Howard Odom, Margaret German Haygood, and Harriet Herring. When Walcott arrived in Chapel Hill in early October, she found Haygood busy reading proofs for her book, Mothers of the South, nursing a sick daughter and fighting a cold. They went out one day, and in Walcott's words, came across a very interesting settlement of Negro owners with well-equipped large farms, some of the grown children going to college, etc. Her assignment on warehouse photographs would have to wait, she reported, to strike her, explaining that an emergency had closed the tobacco markets. Walcott had arrived in North Carolina at an ominous moment. For the first time since 1933, when the New Deal tobacco program began, farmers did not approve acreage control for that year. When the Georgia warehouses opened in August 1939 to handle this bumper crop, farmers bitterly complained the prices dropped from $14 a hundred pounds to $6. Shortly after the war broke out in Europe, the Imperial Tobacco Company, that usually bought a third of the tobacco, pulled its buyers off the market. With practically the entire bright tobacco crop awaiting auction, the crisis forced an immediate, forced immediate government intervention. Farmers quickly approved the referendum, promising to reduce production for the 1940 crop. And the federal government agreed to purchase the imperial share. With their tobacco unsold, Walcott reported, farmers had little spending money. In some cases, not even enough to make a mandatory trip to town on Saturday afternoon. As she says, I was held up for a long time in a rural county. Couldn't get gas because I couldn't get anyone or any store to change a $10 bill. The low prices offered for the 1939 crop intensified farmers enduring this trust of buyers exemplified by the American Tobacco Company's monopoly in the late 19th and early 20th century. Even after the American was broken up, farmers suspected that buyers for American, Lincoln and Myers, Reynolds, Central Leaf, Imperial, and other companies conspired in what they did. On October 17th, Stryker wrote to Walcott that the tobacco markets reopened. She should return to Chapel Hill and resume her work. 
Stryker had meanwhile visited Chapel Hill and talked with Odom and Couch about this project and urged Walcott to contact Couch and listen to his ideas. Incidentally, he wrote, quoting him, he has a writer in there who is following the tobacco story. I suggest you get hold of this fellow. Have a talk with him. He might prove most helpful to you in getting a good tobacco story from farm to market, including the lives of the people, what they think, how they carry on their work. And of course, this was talking about Leonard. Leonard Rapport had a vivid memory of his meeting with Marion Post Walcott. While he's doing that, if Leonard's voice comes on, I'll stop. <laughs> i just walk you very quickly through the, the crop year of a tobacco farm. I'm sure you're all of uh, How many of you have ever She just showed up in Chapel Hill and much to my pleasure because he is this beautiful young woman. She just showed up in Chapel Hill and much to my pleasure Here they're topping the tobacco. You can see the flowery tops 